Franklin, obviously I, I know you from Twitter. We've you've been following the podcast for a while and uh, we've had conversations in the past, I think, about what you do, but for other people's benefit, for this this short snapshot, if you like, let's uh, just tell everybody what your name is, uh, who you served with or who you still serve with and, and where you are in the world. Okay, well, my name's uh, Dr. Franklin Nannis. Uh, uh, I serve, I'm a officer with the uh, uh, Nebraska National Guard. Uh, and now that I say that, I have to say that what I say here isn't sponsored or endorsed by the Department of Defense. It's all my personal <laughs> to keep myself out of the trouble. Uh, and right now I'm sitting in Arlington, Virginia. Nice. So what, what rank are you with National Guard? Uh, major. Oh, okay. Is it... Is it I think the rank systems work slightly different with the US, don't they? So, so with us, um, in fact, it's different probably again with the National Guard. I think for us, a major is, is um, I think I'm with you guys, it's quite a senior rank. I mean, for us, like lieutenant and captain is pretty much, it's a given. Captain's like a given. If you stay in more than like four years, it's a given. It takes some work, mind. But then beyond that is, is, a, is a task. What, what's your experience of it? Uh, yes. So at least from the officer side of the house, uh, you kind of can get away all the way through the rank of captain in the U.S. Army as long as you don't screw up or still a to <laughs> purposely kill anyone. But you have to kind of be invited to stay at the rank of major is how they, they say it. I yeah, think I, the, I, the rank structures, I think, run fairly similar between our militaries, except the insignia, we seem to deviate. So. Uh, not really. Well, just going back, I don't want to do a disservice to all the lieutenants and, and captains that I work with. You know, they they, they graft. Don't get me wrong, but um, it's the same. Any, it's the same as with the uh, with the non with the non comms, as you would say. Where it's, you know, there's certain ranks, private and lance jack. If you stay in for it, lance corporal, that is staying for a amount of time, you're gonna get them. I don't think though that our rank structure is a, a similar. Um, on the on the non commissioned officer side of things, because you, are, I mean. We have, we have, I mean, it all seems quite complicated, but probably it's the same for you guys looking at us. We have a private and a lance corporal and a corporal and a sergeant and a colour sergeant and a warrant officer class two, warrant officer class one, and that's it. You got seven of them. Within those, within the private, you have a bunch of grades, but all the rest, it's just seven. But you are, I mean, you've got about 20 different types of sergeant, have you not? <laughs> uh, well, and we have, well, we have one specialist rank. We used to have a whole different rank structure for, um, essentially sergeants that never had command responsibility. So it was a way of taking a, a technical expert and paying them extra money if you're a machine gunner. But you're right, we have a sergeant or buck sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, master sergeant, first sergeant to roll, sergeant major. Yeah, so we have I think, several more steps, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think you probably, you probably rank the grades, whereas we don't. Um, yeah. So, Dr. Franklin, I should say, call you Franklin, not me. So, you're with the with um, with the National Guard. You you you've mentioned offline that that you've deployed. So, I guess that leads me on to um, what what was your most memorable tour, or what was your most memorable part of a tour that you've done, and where, where was the tour? Uh, so, my only uh, combat experience is in. Uh kind of late 2009, early 2010, I deployed uh, with a ground ambulance medical company. I was a platoon leader back in the, the early days of my officer career, and we went to Cobb Spiker, Iraq, and supported the, the headquarters of the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting experience. I was a, a paramedic on the civilian side when I was a civilian before I joined the Army, um, and I actually got a, my bachelor's degree as in emergency medicine. And it was one of those things where uh, I kind of got a degree. I thought I would never really apply it in my life. And then years later, I was plopped down and said, you're basically in the city of 6,000 people. You now have to run the whole emergency response center. So it was just kind of serendipity where I could say, oh, I actually have the degree that I never thought I'd actually use for this purpose. So That's good. That's a, and uh, Cam, was it Cam Striker? Uh, Cobb Spiker. Oh. Oh, Cobb Striker, Spike, Cobb Spiker, yeah, that, and that was what we were talking about. That was the one. That's the one in Tikrit. And so my the reason when we were talking before about and I knew the name of it is because I used to do private security in Iraq, okay. and not long after I left, ISIS went and 
took over that place, didn't they? When I was out there, it was it was being defended, but I think the Iraqis were controlling it, as in the Iraqi army had it. And then uh, ISIS went and ran up the ground. Because obviously Tikrit is Saddam Hussein's hometown, right? Yes. Yeah. But that base was not popular when you were there. Um, you know, it wasn't too bad of a base to be there, or be in, because, well, if you've been on the ground, that, that base territorial-wise is so massive. We used to joke when we got mortared because the buildings were so far apart that you almost never had a chance of hitting anyone just because there's miles and miles between people. So it was kind of a nice base to be on in that regard. So it wasn't like... It was, it was about seven miles round, right? Something like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it was huge. It's huge. So leading on, leading on then from that on that tour, as a, as a fellow serviceman stroke veteran, um, you, 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 you must have some amusing memories. I know I've got a bunch of them, and, I, and they're almost, you know, a lot of the time they're revolving around chores. So is there something that sticks in your mind as one of the most amusing experiences that you, that you experienced? Um, amusing. Well, or entertaining. In fact, uh, what sticks in your mind the most? What sticks in your mind the most? You know, what sticks in my mind the most probably is not the positive, most positive thing, but it's a story that war never stops for Christmas, but it stops for the Super Bowl. Um, so <laughs> I was a platoon leader, and my platoon sergeant um, was also a paramedic on the civilian side, so we were quite a bit higher trained than the, the regular medic. And on Christmas Day, we would have normally ran essentially three ambulances to respond, and we thought to ourselves, you know what, we're just going to let our soldiers go back, hang out in their living area as long as they have a radio and we can call them, it's fine. And what will happen is if anything happens, myself and my platoon sergeant will go deal with it as long as it's small. And if we have to call for help, we'll call for help. We'll give our Joes the day off. So it's about 11 o'clock. We're sitting in the, the command post and the first sergeant walks in and uh, basically starts screaming, where are the rescue queues, all this. And we tell them, you know, Hey, we're trying to give our soldiers some more time off. Uh, you know, we got anything that handles, and then he gets super upset. And the next thing we know, we have to call in six guys, and we have to bring in all the ambulance crews. You know, they have to drive whatever the mile between their their living area up to the the headquarters to sit around and wait all day, essentially in a box that was made out of plywood. And then a couple months roll around, and uh, here it is on uh, you know Super Bowl. Sunday and all of a sudden the first sergeant walks in like totally normal operations going on and he starts screaming why are your medics here and we're like well you know we always keep our emergency crews here and he's like no, no you should let them go and you should make sure that they get down so they can watch the Super Bowl and you and your your uh, sergeant can take care of any type of emergency that pops up in the meantime so it was just kind of a weird experience that we Kind of weren't allowed to limit operations on Christmas, but Super Bowl, the war actually stopped before the Super Bowl. I, I can kind of believe that. I've never I've never been in the States of Super Bowl, but I see the hype. I can kind I can kind of believe it. Kind of believe it, yeah. <laughs> Who won the Super Bowl that year? I don't even remember. I don't even follow football, so I'm a terrible, <laughs> terrible American in that regard. But if you know anything about Nebraskans, we. Uh, we don't have a professional football team in our state, so we just follow our state college team, the Huskers. So if you ever go to Nebraska, you have to say you're a Huskers fan, whether you're a fan or not. <laughs> it's not warm there, though, is it? Uh, in the summer months, it? it's really warm. It's kind of, yeah, it's got a huge temperature swing to it. So it's, it's cold and miserable and very windy in the winter. And then in the summer months, especially July, August, it can get incredibly hot. That sounds like Wales, except it doesn't get incredibly hot in the summer. <laughs> it gets less rain and less wind. <laughs> so that was an amusing one. What what was your, what has been your toughest toughest experience of being part of uh, being part of the military? That may not be something they've experienced overseas. It may be sending back home. Um, that's the question. What what have you found hardest? Uh, <laughs> So as during my deployment in my position, I didn't typically work directly with patients because I would be kind of more organizing and responding to emergencies. 
but one of our jobs was to ensure that the patients at the, the local hospital were transported to the flight line. So the, the, the folks that were injured that had were bad enough that had to go back to Germany. And uh, every once in a while, depending on what was going on, I'd jump in and really just help as a driver more than interacting with the actual patients. Uh, but uh, seeing some of the, the soldiers that got deeply impacted on in terms of the, the psychological injury of war, and uh, especially being a paramedic prior to my military experience, you could really tell dealing with some of the, the patients just how absolutely dangerous they were and how kind of severe uh, kind of PTSD could affect um, certain few individuals. And it's, it's quite the shame because um, at least in uh, the medical world, we know if you have combat stress, uh, the best way to really treat you is within the sound of the guns. Um, if you find yourself like over the scare, we have to- Within, keep... within what, sorry? So within the sounds of the guns. So um, if you find yourself overwhelmed by combat, if we take you back to a FOB and we let you see a counselor and, and talk to things, if you haven't left country, so if you're still around kind of the sights and sounds of war, um, you learn how to appropriately assess risk and we can kind of coach and teach and mentor you how to deal with the stress better. And there's a lot better recovery for us to take you you know, slightly back to a, a field hospital, treat you and send you back to your unit. But if you are kind of injured enough psychologically that we have to take you from your unit all the way back to Germany or the States, the likelihood of you recovering from that is very, very low because here you have kind of a soldier that's overwhelmed by terror. And then we take you to, we remove you entirely from that fear. We drop you into Germany or America well, that soldier still has fear and they don't get kind of the inoculation back to a way of overcoming and realizing, hey, I can sit in a base in Iraq. Yes, it's kind of scary, but my life really isn't at risk or at risk to the degree I perceive it. But if I take that same individual, drop them in, in San Antonio, they're always going to have that fear like the second I step back in Iraq, I'm going to die. So it's amazing to see the recovery rates of individuals where hey, if you have combat stress, I can treat you on the front line. Highly successful if we don't have to take you all the way back to the States. If you take you back to the States, you're looking at an individual that most likely that's, wants to recover. That's, uh, that's fascinating. It's not a new concept, as you know, um, outside of the military. I mean, I, I, I ride horses, my daughters ride, and, when, and I didn't stop riding until I was an adult. And one of the old things is if you fall off a horse, you make sure you get straight back on immediately you get straight back on so you don't have that fear set and you get back on you okay you're back in control especially prevalent where kids are and so the same concept is exactly what you're saying there but i have never heard of it being done in that situation you're talking about and to, i can absolutely see why it would work in some circumstances maybe not all i mean it depends where you're talking about it wouldn't if you were in a we call them like a checkpoint so a small group of a section or a platoon minus you know in afghan or iraq and, and pretty hot it may not be the best thing to go and take a soldier back into that environment where it is that his life is at risk um but then back into a, a less risky situation i can absolutely see the benefits i cannot see for one minute that the british would do that it's just and again i would imagine that if that was i mean i can't imagine that's common knowledge in the us but i imagine that the public perception of it would be an, a negative thing they would think that maybe the worst thing to do is take him back into a, a, an actual risk high risk environment relatively speaking to civilian street i don't know that's i i, I it's just i've never heard that before i've never heard that you, you guys did that before that's amazing so in this kind of well a terrifying in a way so if you find yourself being the medic for those type of individuals you probably you know halfway through your tour a little bit longer you start kind of understanding how combat's affecting you and you start you know maybe in subtle ways picking up or understanding some of the symptoms that you have yourself you know how you're adjusting or changing because of the combat stress and here you are treating a person that's you know on the far side of the spectrum and you think to yourself like how long is it before i shift from where i am now to kind of this extreme hey i have to be tied down to a gurney and put on a plane or even be removed from theater so that that aspect can kind of be frightening if you work too long with those patients
Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting as well when you mentioned that uh, you had a background in, in uh, being a paramedic before you before you got into the military. Can I ask um, if you've what what is the difference in in rehabilitation in terms of physical no, not physical but mental rehabilitation that you've seen in um, non-military? So when you're a paramedic and you treated people who had traumatic injuries maybe an amputation, maybe a, a, a real, like a compound fracture, real bad thing to look at, car crash, whatever. What is the kind of um, mental rehabilitation differences between that and a, and a soldier um, or an airman or a, or a sailor who's experiences a similar kind of injury? Is, is there, are they similar journeys for the patient? You know, this is hard for me to describe because really when I worked kind of in emergency medic and medicine on the civilian side, it's the, hey, you show up, you get a person to the hospital, and then that ends their job, where military medics, especially ones assigned to units, actually get to see kind of the full journey of a patient. So it's the difference between being a true emergency kind of provider, hey, I'll show up because you're bleeding or you just got in a car wreck. My job is to get you from the car wreck to the hospital where the I think the military medics will track a patient for years, depending how long they stay in unit. So it's it's kind of hard to answer that question. Um, it's true that the military is not unique in terms of the concept of PTSD. So it's kind of, in a way, it's more acceptable to say, hey, I have PTSD because I went to Iraq, than to say, I have PTSD because I went through a hurricane. But that does happen. Um, and having kind of social acceptance to say, hey, you know, people can be pushed past their mental breaking point. And if we accept the fact that some people have those injuries, but the community is there to support them, they get better and kind of overcome that. There's good results. Um, but if you drop people into kind of communities that don't understand those behaviors, or I think the worst offense is if you take a, someone with combat stress, put them in a community that doesn't understand them, and that community says, you know, he's just too dangerous, so we just won't be around him. Because that's, I think, the, I think the absolute worst thing we can do to the soldier. And, 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 that, and that community, a lot of the times, especially in the British, over here, our experiences, um, civilian community, they're all like that. Most of them are, you know. Um, so when a when a soldier, sailor, airman, or an airwoman leaves the military and they and they get out and they come into the civilian street, they may have mental health issues. They may not. They may have PTSD. They may not. And they're into that environment exactly what you're talking about. Which which leads us on to you have mentioned in the past that you you work with veterans back in Nebraska. That you do some voluntary work with them, don't you? Uh, so for a little over a year, I worked with the Nebraska Department of Labor. So I worked with actually uh, specifically in the, our homeless veteran program in terms of finding soldiers that were or veterans that were underemployed or not employed and getting them them work and then kind of reintegrating them back into society and it, some really interesting things. Um, and I'm not sure how the British system works, but um, I almost think that the American compensation system is set up to almost hurt the veterans. So if you get injured in combat, you can apply for veteran administration disabilities. So the government would basically compensate you a certain amount for the rest of your life to say, hey, I broke my thumb in Iraq. I can't use my hand correctly. So the government's going to say, well, we'll write you a check for $130 a month for the rest of your life. That way you can afford different doorknobs um, or hey, you have PTSD, so we're going to give you a check for X amount. But the problem that creates in veterans is the more injured they can present themselves to be, the more money and income it becomes. So the veterans that are especially down and out that become homeless, one of the best ways for them to think that secure resources is to basically become more and more broken. So the more broken they are, the more money they get. And that can lead into a really vicious cycle where Hey, if I can just make my or if my PTSD gets declared severe enough, then the government will say I never have to work again. I'll get you know close to three thousand dollars a month. They'll pay all my bills, and all I have to do is sit at home and play video games. But that's almost the fastest way to to kill a veteran because 
they get highly isolated. They don't have any connection. They have enough resources to essentially buy themselves a studio apartment, forget about the world until they fortunately commit suicide in most cases. And um, one of the things I did with the uh, homeless shelters is not only getting those guys reintegrated back to work, but say there was true cases where um, people have severe PTSD, maybe they can't do an actual job. One of the, the things I would really try to get them to do is do something that resembles a job. And uh, a lot of us would say, hey, if I won the million, or if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd never work again. I'd be happiest man. But research has shown that's actually not the actual case. So if I gave you an infinite amount of money and you never have to go into a job. You never have the community connection to say, hey, I know in my job, there's going to be 12 people asking, hey, where's Franklin today if I don't show up? But if I had resources where I didn't have that community, I wouldn't have those people or I wouldn't have, you know, that that personal connection. So even if we had veterans that were kind of severely disabled, we would say, hey, you need to go volunteer somewhere. You need to go be part of a community and you need to really think of it as a job because this is one of the things that will help keep you alive. And it's actually like the second research wise, the second leading cause of happiness in one's life is having a good job or at least having a purpose where you go into and you form communities. So uh, that was kind of the big effort that I that I did in that job. And it's, it's kind of remarkable to see. I, I really had two types of veterans that would walk into my office. So we had a little thrift store that was right across from where I worked that would pretty much hire anyone, even if you had a felony. They would just give you a chance. You could reestablish thrift. yourself. A thrift store being a, a um, second-hand shop, right? Charity yes. shop. Yes. So if I had a veteran walked in, he said, hey, I was totally unemployed. If I said, hey, right now I can walk you across the street and get a job working for minimum wage. If that veteran said, yes, I'll take it. Within four months later, I get that veteran an exceptionally well-paid job and get him off the street. But if they said, no, I won't work for minimum wage, they were almost always guaranteed to stay in their bad situation. So a lot of ways it was like, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to reprove myself. You know, I've done this before. It's just going to be miserable. But, you know, four months later, I'll have a better job and move on with my life. We've, we've got about 30 seconds left, mate. Uh, we have, I have a term for that, which I got from someone else, and that's called being a job snob. And it's oh, don't, yeah. be a, don't be a job stop because it, it has so many benefits in doing it. I, I, could, we, I think we should have another call, right? We, we can carry on this conversation. We will. We come up with that. But while well, we're going we're gonna to finish this one off, can you just very quickly talk about your evolving warfighter um, stuff and then how can people find your folio? Okay. So the evolving warfighter uh, started from my research out of my own pursuit of my own education degree because I just love studying. Um, and I studied how uh, soldiers can really teach themselves the things that the military is not teaching that would be beneficial to them. So it covers everything from uh, how to read books better to how to understand philosophy and how it might impact our lives um, in quite a broad range of guests so far. So I'm hoping to expand the project. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, the channel is called The Evolving Warfighter, or you can find me on Twitter. Uh, handle got slightly shorter, but it's at Evolving War. Um, and I look forward to seeing the folks around. All right, Dr. Franklin Alice, it's been an absolute pleasure. We're going to do this again, definitely. Outstanding. <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks a lot, buddy.